and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we would look at investor losses, and specifically, we're going to be looking at rules that determining passive activities, which is we're going to be talking a little bit more about what we call material participation. This topic is covered in an income tax course, the CPA exam regulation section, as well as the enrolled agent exam. As always, I would like to remind my viewers, which is you, to connect with me on a personal as well as a professional level. If you have a LinkedIn account, please connect with me. If you're a Facebook user, like my Facebook page and connect with me on a personal level. YouTube, you want to make sure you subscribe to my YouTube. This is where I house all my lectures, so you're always aware of any additional lectures. Please like the lectures if you like them, share them, put them in playlists, and email them, and let your classmate knows about them. I do have a Twitter account, and this is why my, my Twitter handle, and on my website you can find most of my lecture organized by course and chapter. This recording is brought to you by Jaeger CPA Review. If you like this recording, you can find hundreds of hours of similar recordings on Jaeger CPA Review, plus thousands of multiple choice questions with detailed solutions. So if you're a CPA student, or if you are an accounting student, you can supplement your resources with simulations, textbook, audio lectures for retention purposes, electronic flashcards, plus others. If you happen to use Jaeger, use the PMF code and you will get 10% off of the best valued CPA course. You will ben benefit yourself and benefit this channel. So let's go ahead and start by a quick review. If you guys remember from the prior session, I said the second layer that the Congress in, uh, introduced to combat tax sheltering is the passive activity determination. Basically, what is the passive activity loss? Basically, what they did is they broke income into three categories. Active income, which, which are salaries, wages, profit from business, sale of assets of a business. Portfolio income, such as interest income, dividend, annuity, sales of assets that produce that investment income. And the third category, which is passive. And this is what we need to discuss in this session. Passive income or passive loss. The taxpayer does not materially participate. So now what we have to figure out is what is material participation and what's not material participation? Because what matters is, is this passive? If the activity is considered passive, it cannot offset portfolio or active income. So this is the, this is the problem. If it's passive, it cannot offset portfolio or active income. So any trade, or a business or income producing activity in which the taxpayer does not materially participate is a passive activity. Now, we're gonna have to talk a little bit more about what we mean by material participation. Now, subject to certain exception, we, we could always assume that rental activities, and we're gonna see some exceptions later on, so notice we have exceptions, whether the taxpayer materially participate or not is considered passive. So, every time you hear rental, with some exceptions, we're going to talk about the exception later. It's automatically passive activity, okay? Because the original rule, the reason is this: the original rule was that when Congress tried to try to curb the abuse of the tax shelters, they were targeting rental activities. Therefore, all rental activities is considered passive, unless it meets some of the exceptions. Okay? So, but to really figure out if it if the activity is a passive or not passive, we have to address three questions. What constitute an activity? So when we say activity, what is that? What constitute an activity? And this is going to be, I'm going to refer to, to this as question one. What is meant by material participation? I'm going to be referring to the quest, to refer to this by question two. And when is an activity a rental activity? And this is going to be question three. So the next session and the next slide on the next slides i'm going to be addressing those three questions addressing those three questions and the first one is what constitute an activity what constitute an activity well, which is basically can you identify the activity so the treasury regulation tells you what is an activity well here's what they tell you it's basically very general taxpayer can treat one or more trade or business activities or rental activities as a single activity if those activity form an appropriate economic unit for measuring gains or losses. Because what happened is this, sometimes you might be have cert at more than one unit, more than one business, separate businesses. So are these separate businesses or are they the same business? Well, it all depends on how you treat them. Okay, are they one economic unit for measuring gain or losses or do you measure gain and losses separately for each unit? 
Well, guess what? In making this decision, you have to consider all relevant facts and circumstances because each business is different. And it matters if you're gonna if something's gonna be treated as a separate activity from the other. Because in one activity, because you could have many businesses, you might be active. And the active it means you are actively participating in the in the in the other business, you might be passive. So it makes a difference to your bottom line. And let me show you what we mean by this. Ben owns a business with two separate departments. So it's a one business, but it's two separate department. Department A that generated net income. So with A, we have net income of 120,000. And we have department B that generate a loss of 95,000. So Ben participate 700 hours in the operation of A. So just want to let you know right now, because we're going to talk about the hours shortly. What we say is Ben is active. He's not passive in A. So in in department A, okay, he is active in department A. And we'll find out why later. And 100 hours in department B, okay? And this is basically, generally speaking, he's passive. If Ben is allowed to treat the department as component of a single activity, so if those are considered a single activity, he can offset the $95,000 loss with Department B against $120,000 loss from Department A. So if this is one unit, then guess what? We have 120 of income minus 95 of losses. Okay, so they are considered one unit. Okay. If Ben is required to treat each department as a separate entity, the tax result is not as favorable. Because his material participant in Department A, again, we I told you to accept this. He devoted 700 hours to it. We're going to talk about this shortly. So the profit is active income. So from A, this is I told you it's active. Assuming that Ben is not considered a material participant in B, we're going to assume that he is not. He could be, but we're assuming he's not. The $95,000 loss is a passive loss. As a result, now Ben cannot offset the losses, the passive activity loss, with the income from A. So now, if they are considered two separate activities, then the situation is changing. He cannot say, well, I'm going to take my income minus my losses. Now, this income will be active income and the law and the loss, the $95,000 loss will be treated separately. So it matters how you, how you, how you organize your activities. Now, which should it be separate? Should it be the same? Again, it all depends on the facts and the circumstance. Another issue that comes up with activities is grouping and regrouping because as we said you could have more than one department so what can you do can you group them and re regroup them well taxpayers should consider all tax factors so should you combine a and b a b and c or should you treat a separately b separately or combine a and b and keep c separately it just how would you do so so but bear in mind once activities is grouped you cannot regroup so you, that's why you have to take consider all tax factors before you do so well you can regroup them if the original grouping was clearly inappropriate or there has been a material change in the fact of circumstances. So can you regroup them? Yes, you can, but you have to have a, re a valid reason why or the circumstances have changes. So so simply put, the government, it, it, it lets you determine the grouping and the regrouping. But once you group them, you cannot regroup them. Okay, Ge that's the general rule, unless it was inappropriate or circumstances have changed let's take a look at this example george owns a men's clothing store and a brew pub in chicago so he owns clothing store and a brew pub he also owns a men's clothing store and a brew pub in milwaukee okay reasonable method of applying the fact and circumstances test may result in in any of the following grouping so what can george do well all four activities we can say they're under the same owner therefore they're one unit or we could say the clothing store might be grouped as one activity and the brew pubs because they're separate activity in another activity. So now we have two. The Chicago activities may be grouped in, is into an activity. For example, we'd say Chicago is an activity and Milwaukee is a separate activity. Two activities, but based on geographical area. Or we can say each of the four units may be treated as a separate activity. Or we can treat each unit, each unit as a separate entity. Okay, so notice there is flexibility in how we do so, but we have to be careful. So this is basically question one. What constitute an activity? The second question we have to answer is material participation. Okay, what constitute material participation? What's meant by material participation? Okay, an activity is treated as an active rather than passive 
that's not subject to the passive activity loss. We, we, we don't want it to be subject to the passive activity loss. If the taxpayer meets one of the seven material participation tests. So when it comes to material participation, we're going to have seven tests that we're going to have to go through. Okay, test one. Taxpayer participated in the activity more than more than 500 hours. If the answer is yes, then this is an active. Okay, so did you participate more than 500 hours? But test two. Taxpayer participation in the activity is substantially all the participation of the activity of all individuals for the year. So he did most of the work for the whole entity. It doesn't, there is no, there is no specific number of hours, but the taxpayer activity is substantially all of the participation. So basically he's in charge of everything. Okay, he's running the business from A to Z, basically. Test three. Taxpayer participated in the activity more than 100 hours during the year and not less. And notice here that just not 100 hours. Remember, don't forget the other part and not less than the participation of any other individual in the activity. What does that mean? It means you participated more than any other individual, but you have to put more than 100 hours. If that's the case, it's active. Test four. Taxpayers participation in the activity is significant and the taxpayers aggregate participation in all significant participation activities during the year exceeds 500, 500 hours. So your, your participation is significant. Now what is significant? It means you are making the major decision and the taxpayer aggregate, which is all the addition participation and all significant participation activity during the year exceeds 500 hours. Then that's also would, would make you active. Okay, and significant participation is more than 100 hours. So that's one aspect of it. It's more than $100 to be significant. It has to be more than 100 hours. Test five. Taxpayer materially participated in the activity for any five during the past 10 years. So basically, we would look at the past 10 years. Okay, and as long as you are active in the past five years, whatever under, under any of the test, then you are active. Okay, if you are active for the past of past five of the past 10 years, then you are active. Test six, the activity is a personal service activity. What does that mean? It means the taxpayer materially participated. So if, you're, if it's a personal, it means it needs, your, it needs your work. If you're a lawyer, you're an accountant, those are personal service. You need to be involved in the activity, okay? So in that situation, the taxpayer materially participated for the any three preceding years, then it becomes active. Okay, especially if you are participating and you have to be participating. Test seven, based on the fact and circumstances, taxpayer participated in the activity on regular, continuous, and substantial basis. Okay, so please note that regular, continuous, and substantial are not specifically defined in the regulation. What does define this? It just, it's based on facts and circumstances. So you have to meet any of these seven tests, okay, for the activity to be considered active. Now, the, the point is, you want to avoid the passive category. You don't want to be considered passive. Why? Because if you incur a loss, passive losses are only deducted against passive income. You want it to be an active business and generate losses, and those losses can offset other income. Okay, let's take a look at a couple examples just to see how this whole thing works. Noah is a corporate executive, earns a salary of $600,000 per year. In addition, he owns a separate business in which he participates. The business produced a loss of $100,000 during the year. If Noah materially, materially participate in the business, the $100,000 is an active loss that might offset his income. So if he is considered mater materially participant, participant in this business, therefore his taxable income becomes $500,000. Okay? He saved himself $100,000 in taxes. If he's, not material, if he's not materially participant, the loss is passive and is suspended unless he has other passive income. No one may use the suspended loss in the future only when the passive activity income is disposed of. So basically, when can he use the losses if it's not now when he get rid of that business, that side business, okay? Let's take a look at this. Jung Hee is an attorney, earns $350,000 a year in her law practice. In addition, she owns an interest in two activities, A and B, in which she participate. Activity A, in which she does not materially participate, loses $50,000. So A, we have a loss, and A, we said passive. She doesn't materially participate. B, 
produces income of 80,000. We have income here. We don't have a loss. However, um, it produces income. However, Janky has not met the material participation standard described for activity B. So also B is not, it's considered for now, passive. So they're both passive. Okay. Um, but if Jangi can meet the material participation standard if she spent an additional 50 hours in activity B during the year. All what she need to do for B, if she put an additional 50 hours, then B becomes active. Okay. Should Jangi attempt to meet the material participation standard for B? So should she put the additional 50 hours? What do you think? Should she make this income as active income? What do you think? I hope you see that's not in her best interest. Okay. If she continues working in activity B and becomes a material participant, the $80,000 of income from activity B becomes active. What's going to happen? The $50,000 passive activity loss from A may be suspended. Now she can no longer cancel B with A. So if she participates in B and makes it active, remember A is incurring losses. A is incurring losses. If that's the case, keep B passive. Why? Because we're going to take the income from B and, uh, and uh, take the loss from A and reduce the income from B. If we make B active, then our losses from A is ba are basically suspended. Okay? So what's a more favorable strategy? is for Jangi not to meet the material participation for B, thus making the income from that passive, um, uh, thus making the income from the activity passive. This enables her to offset the 50,000 passive activity loss from A against the income from B. So don't make B active. Why? Because you have passive losses. You could use the losses to offset B's income. Otherwise, if you make B active, then the $50,000, they become not useful for you, at least for now, until you get rid of the business or you have another uh, passive passive income from another business so we have to be careful hopefully this kind of this example is really good okay more on participation what what consider participation okay generally speaking participation is any work done by an individual okay now does not include now be careful does not include if the type of the work is not customarily done by owners and if one of the and if one of the principal purposes is to avoid the disallowance of passive losses so if you're just doing work that's you're only doing the work you're, you're adding up the hours which is really that's not what you should be doing for example you're cutting the grass and that's not what you should be doing or uh, uh, you are um, uh, carrying out uh, maybe simple tasks just to basically to add up the hours that's not allowed that's not allowed okay and the hours not allowed if they are being done as your capacity as an investor remember if you have a business that's your business. But if you make investment decision, like for example, when you go to meet with the bank, for example, if you're negotiating a line of credit, that's the job of an investor. If you meet with potential investors to raise money for the business, those hours are not used. Okay, so work done in individual capacity as an investor. Don't count those hours. Now, participation by an owner's spouse count as participation. So if, you're, if your spouse participated in the business, then that will be added to your hours so you and your spouse together as long as you meet the 500 hours if that's one of the tests then you should be good to go let's take a look at an example to illustrate what i just said emma who's a partner in cpa firm owns a computer store that operate at a loss to offset this loss against the income from her cpa practice emma would like to avoid having this computer business classified as passive so emma wants to kind of turn it from passive to active during the year she worked 480 hours. Well, for one thing, she's below 500. And in the business, uh, in, the, in the business and management and sales, and 30 hours doing genitorial chores. In addition, Emma spouse participated 40 hours. So she did 480 hours, okay, in the business in management and sales and 30 hours in genitorial services, not 480,000, 480 hours. It is likely that Emma 480 hours of participation in management and sales will count as participation in the work because that's what, you know, if you are owner manager, that's what you do. But the 30 hours spent doing genitorial chores will not. So remember that 30 additional hours because it's not, it's not customarily done by the owner. 
If it's customarily done, that's different, but we're going to be assuming here it's not customarily done by the owner. In addition, the 40 hours participation of the spouse, so we can add the 40 hours by the spouse, will make the will make this business an active partic active business. Well, if it's active business, that's good. It means the losses from this business, if they are active, they can offset her income from the CPA firm. So you, in this situation, Emma wants the business to be active, okay? But she cannot do genitorial work to add up the to to add up the hours. But she can count her, count her spouse's hours, okay? So hopefully we get a good idea about what active participation means, okay? Or active, yes. What 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 what's qualified or what constitute material participation, not active participation? What's once it's once we need the material participation, well, guess what? Then it is active business. Then we can deduct the active. Then we can deduct the losses because it's active against active income. Okay. One more topic. The third question we need to talk about is rental activities. Remember, rental activities. What did we say about rental activities? Automatically passive. Automatically passive. Again, because the the rules was to curb rental activity abuse unless it meets one of the exceptions. So, what are the exceptions? Right. Well, temporary regulation provide exception for certain situation where the activity involved rental of real and personal property. Okay, that are not treated as rental activities. Okay, let me tell you. I used to own a rental property. So basically, I used I used to own a home, a two unit. I used to live on the first floor and I used to rent the second floor. Okay? So this is a rental property. This is rental. This is rental property. Guess what? There's an exception for me. There's going to be an exception for me. You will see it later. But this is what I'm trying to say. Okay? It was that I was working in a CPA firm. That was my full-time job. I was also teaching. But I also had rental property. Well, you're going to see passive activity will not apply to me. Okay? But this is basically, we're going to see this more, much more in details. But okay. But here, here we go. If exception applies, activity is subject to the material participation test. So if your rental activities and they give you an exception, you still have to materially participate in the business. Okay? Let me show you an example. Sarah owns a fleet of automobiles that are held for rent. She spends on average 60 hours a week in the activity. Assuming that her, her automobile business is considered rental activity, it's automatically subject to the passive activity rules, even though Sarah spends more than five how, 500 how, hours a year in its operation. Once it's rental activity, automatically, automatically, it is, it is passive. So I'll take a look at Arturo. He owns a bicycle rental business at a nearby resort. Because the average period of customer use is seven days or less, Arturo's business is not treated as rental. So now what we have sometimes, it looks like a rental business, but the majority of the service is basically servicing the customer rather than generating money from the rental. Okay, so there's a significant portion of the business is service the customers. Under those circumstances, then it's not considered rental prop, re rental business, okay? Other examples similar to this one will be if you have a hotels, motels, rentals, tuxedos. Now remember, in this example, we assumed, notice, we assumed that her automobile business is classified as rental, okay? It may not be classified as rental, but we assume it's classified as rental because rent and automobile is also kind of a short period of time. Okay, if you have any questions, and this is the third question that we dealt with, if you have any questions, any comments, please email me. Or if you have, you know, if you want to view additional related lectures, please go to my website. If you happen to go to my website, please consider donating.